Hello, my name is Lisa Ann Pinkerton, founder and chairwoman of Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability. This video is a part of our continuing series on women in the spotlight. The mission of this series is to highlight successful women in the green economy and provide role models for other working women in the sector. And today, we are very excited to host Amy Francetic, CEO of the Clean Energy Trust in Chicago. She helped co-found the Clean Energy Trust to accelerate the pace of clean energy innovations in the Midwest. And Amy, welcome to Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability. Thank you, Lisa Ann. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. It's great to have you here. Before we get into your story, um, I'm wondering maybe if you could give us a little bit more information on what the Clean Energy Trust is and what you guys do. Sure, sure. So we are a, um, a clean energy accelerator in Chicago. and. We are a 501c nonprofit. Um, we actually work, our mission is to accelerate the pace of innovation throughout the Midwest, specifically in clean energy. And so um, our goal is to try to solve the world's um, environmental and energy problems through technology innovation that can be um, harvested in the Midwest and then uh, scaled up around the world. So we work a lot with scientists, entrepreneurs, researchers. Um, and we do three things. We provide them uh, mentorship and technical assistance for free, and we have a very broad uh, base of mentors and advisors who help with that. And then we provide funding, so we're oftentimes the first funding into a company. Um, and we do that through our Clean Energy Challenge, which is a platform for um, um, finding the best new clean energy ideas. And then the third thing we do is education and advocacy. And so we do a little bit of policy work, and then we have an online uh, database that kind of counts and measures all the companies in the space to help inform our advocacy efforts. What, what's the story of how you arrived here today? What, what brought you to be, being the CEO of the Clean Energy Stru Trust? Well, we, uh, so sort of working backwards, we started three years ago. And so we're three years old, and um, I met... Nick Pritzker and Michael Polsky, who are my co-chairs of the organization. Um, Nick Pritzker is a, a, a successful businessman who um, who used to be the co-chair of, uh, or rather, the vice chair of Hyatt Corporation. And then um, Michael Polsky is the CEO of Invenergy. It's the largest independently owned renewable developer uh, in the world. And so Nick and Michael had this idea, and they wanted to um, they wanted to they, they felt, felt like there was a lot of great potential in the Midwest, but it wasn't being harvested, and they wanted to do something around entrepreneurship. So they approached me and said, we have this idea. Could you help us figure out what to do? And so we set about trying to figure out what to do, and we what we created was the Clean Energy Trust. Um, and, uh, and, and before that, I had been working in private equity, and I covered the IT sector and clean energy. Um, and before that, I was an entrepreneur. Um, for, I worked in the high tech industry first. Uh, I went to Stanford, so I, I although I grew up in the Midwest, I came out to the West Coast for school. Um, and after Stanford, I worked in the high tech industry and video games. And so, when you, when you think about being a female in the space, female CEO, um, uh, did you have any mentors along the way that helped you? And, and what did you learn from them? Well, one of my um, one of my mentors that became a good friend is named Kathy Schlein, and she's actually in California still. And I worked for her when I was at a uh, toy company called Hasbro, and we were starting a line of software for them. And this was in the early '90s, and she was the first woman that I worked for who was uh, a very strong, articulate, funny, like just really herself. Like her personality was very likable, but she was also very, you know, strong and smart and, and didn't try to water that down. So I think she was really a great mentor for me because, um, well, first of all, she hired me, so I felt like we had a connection. <laughs> um, uh, and, 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 but next, she took some time to, like, really help me and give me advice, and, and, um, and she had worked at Apple in the early days and, um, and knew, you know, had worked with Steve Jobs and so had really seen kind of the birth of that company and could talk about, you know, how important innovation is to a new company and how do you protect creativity and other things that became um, continuing themes for me in my career, you know, and also like how to work with engineers and scientists. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I love science, and so I consider myself a science junkie, 
And I think that appreciation for what scientists and engineers do and then figuring out what my contribution is. You know, I'm not going to ever understand or be able to critique, you know, how they're doing their research or how they're going to engineer something. Um, but my role is going to be more in figuring out how to bring that to market, how to commercialize it, how do you fund it, how would you, you know, how do you sort of tune it so it fits a real market need, how do you get feedback from the customer into the process. So those are the kinds of things that I learned from her that she had really perfected in her career. And she was really generous in teaching me uh, some of that, too, and really encouraging. You know, mm -hmm. I think um, we liked each other right away, and she was really encouraging to me personally. I like how you said that she really had showed her personality and, and was funny and would just, would just was herself yeah. as a leader. Yeah, like yeah, that. definitely. Yeah, she wasn't... Um, um, you know, she was ir irreverent, um, you know, we, we had a lot of fun, and she wasn't so concerned what people thought of her, or she wasn't, you know, always trying to be sort of the perfect, you know, leader, and, you know, she was um, emotional in a really good way, you know, like she really cared about the team and got really mad when things didn't, you know, work out the way we wanted them to, and also was really sad if something didn't go, I mean, that was sort of, she wasn't really afraid to um, show kind of the range of emotions on the job, which um, until then I had been working in a really, you know, I had worked at Electronic Arts and a few other places, and that wasn't something that was really, um, not, not necessarily allowed, but it wasn't really demonstrated very much uh, in, in earlier in my career. So, mm -hmm. And so is that, is that some advice that you would give to women currently into the space, just to sort of be themselves and, and show their personality? Or what would be your advice? Well, I, I think, you know, I think that, Especially in 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 clean energy, I mean, it, there's we need so many more women. That there, it, there aren't enough, right? So there aren't enough. So you do have to. I mean, that makes it a little harder because it's harder to find peers and friends that are women in the in the space. Um, and it also means that the men that you're working with, uh, they just have different reality. I and mean, especially if you get to be like in my situation, I have kids, you know, and so. Um, I know from, there's been a few studies done in the science space, and, it, and there, I can't remember the author, I thought it was a Stanford um, scientist, I'll have to maybe get back to you on the name of this, uh, this woman, but she did a great you know, study on the tenure-track science um, PhD students, and then you know, who was turning into tenure-track professors, and women and men were coming into their PhD programs in relatively equal numbers, but the, but the women dropped off on the tenure-track, and she was trying to understand why. And a lot of it was because they didn't find mentors that were women along the way, and they couldn't see balancing their um, what they wanted in their home life with the demands of uh, the work life. And the men that they saw that were successful um, were workaholics. You know, I and mean, they worked a ton. They had a wife that raised the kids, and so it was really hard to imagine how you did that. Um, as a woman, and that was part of what discouraged women. And and, and we've seen that too. We see a lot of really excited uh, women graduating with now some very specialized degrees in environmental science and, and energy policy, and um, which is terrific. None of those majors existed when I was in college, so it's really cool. If you like this, you can actually now you know, customize and get a major in this. Um, but I, I think that there are still very few women CEOs or you know leading scientists in the field. And that sort of goes into my next, my next question. You were talking about um, these measurements of success and, and that you've got two young girls that you've been raising there in Chicago. And so what are some, what's one of your tricks to maintaining this work-life balance that can be so difficult to hold it, on to? <laughs> well, it's funny. I have accepted a high degree of imperfection in every aspect of my life. That's, that's the only, that's the only trick that I have is when things, you know, it's like, when something, I can't do something at work exactly right, or I can't travel to that invitation or that meeting, or um, I have to, or things have to happen slower because I cannot put in, you know, a 70 hour work week. That is part of the imperfection um, that it, I have to accept. I mean, when I can't be at the things that are at my, ch my children's school, you know, I can't attend or be involved or be a room mom because of the demands on time. Um, and sadly, in my kids' school, um, most of the parent involvement is during the day, so they're not like very sympathetic to working women. I hope that's not the case as much in the Bay Area. I, I found that to be a big change, actually, when I moved here. Um, and I live in Lake Forest, um, which is a suburban community. I, I bet it's a little different in Chicago. 
um, in a metropolitan area, but you know, it's it's a little harder to participate in some of that stuff because it would mean I'd have to miss like a whole day of work, you know, to go for an hour for whatever the activity is at school. Um, and then I think even as a as a wife, I mean, it's very, you know, it's like my husband and I were like retired a lot, you know. So I mean, it doesn't mean I wouldn't want to have what we have, but it means that we don't probably have as um, as active of a social life. Like we love Saturday nights with our kids, you know. So we we we. We don't we don't feel like we're lacking in our social life, but we probably don't plan as much stuff out as most people do because to us, like Saturday night having dinner with our girls and like, you know, seeing a movie or going to the beach is better than getting a sitter and going out to a party. Like we you know, so we don't probably do as much at um, on the weekends at night as most uh, people do because um, we just want to sort of slow down on the weekends uh, and be with our kids. But yeah, I think that's stuff that everybody's struggling with too, you know. Um, and I think we've learned now working longer doesn't mean you're working better. I think the longer you work, the less productive you are, you know, anyway. So um, the time that I can have with my kids, you know, reading a book, watching a movie, playing soccer or whatever, that to me is, you know, that's good to get away from work for a while too. Mm -hmm. So even if it's active, it's not me just sort of sitting and being by myself, it's still not, I think, I'm not, I'm not feeling like I'm getting burned out on work. Right, right, right. And taking those breaks, then you can work more productively later on. If you get yourself burnt out, then you actually have to stop and take a longer break. Yeah, exactly, exactly, to, that's right. Or you get back. sick, right? You get so sick. I mean, that's the downside is you get unhealthy. Your so. body forces you to take a break. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this has been really wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about or a question you thought I'd ask that I didn't? No, I just want to commend you for doing what you're doing. I think it's terrific. Uh, Lisa Ann and I will try to keep thinking of other women that you can, you know, write about and feature. And, and there's a few women, you know, CEOs in the Midwest I think would make terrific um, subjects for you. So I hope, uh, I just, you know, wish you a lot of luck kind of growing your audience and we'd be I'd be happy to you know promote what you're doing in our region to get you some more participants from the Midwest because it's really it's really wonderful and I, I totally applaud it and I uh, hope you can teach me a few things too through all of your <laughs> all of your interviews I'd love to hear what some of these other women have to say because uh like I said it's it's everybody's struggling doing this trying to make it all work and I, I don't feel like I have figured it all out so I'd love to hear what some of the other women are doing. Oh thank you so much Amy yeah we'll definitely stay in touch and and I'll, I'll send you the tips make sure. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. That would be great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. This has been uh, Amy Francetic, CEO of the Clean Energy Trust. I'm Lisa Ann Pinkerton from Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability. Until next time have a great day.